Hi, welcome to chapter two. In this chapter, we'll be talking about the many different types of healthcare organizations and insurance organizations, and there will be a lot of abbreviations in here. I will do my best not to use them. Uh, if I do, and you need to look one up, they are all in the glossary in the back of our textbook, Essentials of Managed Care. And the glossary is really quite good. You will find virtually every acronym and any acronym used in managed care in the back of the text. Well, the first issues that one has, uh, do you have a single employer or a memoir or a MET? I've added uh, what the uh, acronyms stand for in many of the slides, and this is a multi-employee welfare or trust organization, and it's basically self-funded insurance. And it means basically that the employer is the one who pays the insurance costs or the care costs, actually. And if you work for a large company uh, like a um, IBM or something like that, they usually pay their own health care costs. And um, what they do have is a special type of reinsurance, or we might know it as an umbrella policy, you know, those things that will raise your auto and homeowner's insurance to a million dollars to protect you against a catastrophe. Um, the problem with reinsurance can be the, that the insurance company may or may not decide to cover a condition or a person. They may tell the employer, we are not going to pay for a bone marrow transplant or a liver transplant or something that can cost hundreds of thousand dollars. But the employer needs to negotiate that and if the employer can't negotiate that the employer will still be on the hook for the difference so reinsurance is something that is done very intensely uh, by employers and, and you may have even heard of places like Lloyd's of London that'll that'll insure an oil tanker or something they're basically a re a reinsurance company and they do the big stuff from a lot of different people and they only pay after a certain level is hit. So reinsurance might go into effect after the employer may spend $200,000 on one patient's episode a year or however they negotiate it. Um, as I said, large employers are most likely to self-fund. 59% of them are self-funded in 2010. And the reason for this is there are tax advantages for the employer. If the employer allocates more money to medical care than they spend, it's sort of like a profit. Uh, instead of going to the insurance company in the form of premiums, and it really would only work for a very big organization. Imagine if you're a small group of employees, like 25, and one needs a heart plant or other medical procedure, then you're in big trouble, even if the other 24 are healthy. So this is really only something that works with many thousands of employees where you can distribute the risk accordingly. Well, this is just a nice little chart that shows you um, the whole spread of um, managed care organizations. And they go from the left from managed indemnity um, with basically no controls over medical costs and quality to a closed panel HMO, which would have the most control over medical cost and quality. And as you get move up toward the closed HMO, there are new elements of management and control which make them tighter. Uh, they may control things like how to actually treat a disease. There's more information. And with tighter control, you have you could have a higher overhead and administrative costs, but lower medical costs because you don't pay for things you don't need. You might even have better quality or more quality control. And overall, the net cost is, is lower. And these programs can be either for insured or provide or be a service organization where they only provide service. And an HMO can be either profit or nonprofit, sort of like a Kaiser, which is probably still nonprofit, 
and some of the blues, which essentially are profit, profit organizations now. Well, manage indemnity is pretty much a standard policy similar to what used to be the standard of insurance in the United States. You hit your deductible, and once you hit your deductible, a certain percentage is paid, and you have co-payments. Well, they will provide um, the, the, the provider directly if the member assigns the benefit. Um, there were really no restrictions um, other than certain coverage issues, such as it being medically necessary, and any licensed provider can be paid. Well, there really isn't any um, utilization management. Um, there could be some pre-certification. Usually they offer a second opinion at no charge. There's really, there might be some case management if you're massively ill and it's the insured person really has to comply with the ru rules. And this system is very costly and really doesn't exist very much anymore. A service plan is a little different. Um, it's usually a Blue Cross Blue Shield, and um, the contracts are with providers who are participating, and it provides direct payment to PAR providers. Um, they may refuse to pay non-providers unless um, required to under state law and that mean, I mean non-participating providers. It's, the payment is based on a specific uh, fee schedule. There can be various different ways of paying hospitals or nursing homes or doctors, but there's no risk sharing. And we'll talk risk sharing later on, but it basically means where um, the provider can be at risk financially uh, when providing a service. No balance billing for disallowed amounts, meaning if the insurance company says or the plan says we will pay $50 for something and the doctor wants $60, they cannot bill you for that $10. Um, the plan can make some judgments retrospectively about whether the care is appropriate. There are very declared uh, very clear defined rights and responsibilities about what people have to do. Otherwise, it's very similar to an indemnity plan, and um, most of this is converted to a PPO or a, per, a preferred provider organization form, although it is, still exists here and there, and that's why we a preferred provider organization is really the, 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 the current uh, dominant form. Um, the networks are smaller than a total universe. They're, the blues are often using this. And the way it basically works is if you're using a participating provider, you get you pay less. So they incentivize you to stay in network. Uh, for example, you know, your copay could be 20% versus 40% out, out of network. Some states are limiting the difference by state law because some of you may have heard of some of the disasters where a patient will walk into a non-network hospital or see a non-network uh, doctor on an, em an emergency and be responsible for huge amounts of money and this makes the news and actually I think there are some laws being passed to inhibit this as we speak. Uh, one of the things a preferred provider may have is a selective network of um, doctors versus any willing provider network, which means any willing provider means that um, any doctor who is willing to take the patients has to be paid. Um, this was passed by many states to counter some of the HMO um, bad news or bad publicity they received in the past. There can be pre-certification and the responsibility of the member for out-of-network plans can be significant. Um, you can be plan-sponsored uh, for, cer for certain aspects or provider-sponsored. And some places actually rent groups, and you can actually have a 
an organization of doctors that are rented out to provide medical care to a PPO in a geographic area. Um, an exclusive provider organization is just that. You can't go out of network. And it can be used by a large employer who has lots of employees, perhaps in a, in a, in a defined area where this becomes realistic. Um, it's not used much in, in the New York area, to the best of my knowledge, but um, local governments might be able to use this because naturally their employees would be defined by a tight geographic area. And of course, there is some option and, and insurance coverage that's appropriate if they get sick when outside of the local area, of course. HMOs. Every, this is the word everybody has heard of. There are three broad plans, open panel, true network, and closed panels, but they all will share some things in common. They are licensed by states under various laws, and they have to have a certain amount of money to make sure that they can pay claims or take care of patients regardless of their own financial state. Um, they have to include something called no balance billing or hold harmless, which means um, the patient is not obligated to pay anything, no matter what the HMO does. To keep costs under control and incentivize their doctors, they will share some level of financial risk with, phys with physicians, with primary care. You know, they could be capitated or non-capitated. There could be, and we'll talk more about this, incentives for hitting budgets or not. Um, it can be, there can be risk with the group, the individual practice association or independent physicians association. And it is somewhat modest. It isn't exclusive. And it's a little different from Medicare HMOs. Um, most of these HMOs use a gatekeeper who's a primary care physician, and you generally have to select one who is your main doctor and coordinator of other care. He must authorize referral to a specialist. Uh, one of the flashbacks that we discussed in the last lecture was OBGYNs are now considered primary care. And hospital admission can require uh, authorization. And the authorization may be either by the HMO or by the specialist, but not usually the primary care doctor. Open access models won't use that. And uh, basically, they try to incentivize you to see the primary care doctor by having a lower copay, and um, they don't require referrals. And many of you have plans where it's twenty or twenty-five dollars to see a local uh, primary care doctor, and it can be anywhere from forty dollars to a hundred dollars to see specialists. Well, an open panel HMO will have a direct contract with providers. Um, they generally will contract with independent practice associations, and these are groups of doctors that get together to have negotiating power with the HMOs. And about half of the HMOs in the U.S. use this um, plan. And a network is essentially part of the IPA. Um, there can be some true network models. A closed panel HMO is very strong. It can be a medical group, meaning a whole bunch of doctors where the HMO uh, participants must go to. It can be a staff model where they're employed by the HMO directly, the providers. Closed panels really aren't used a term anymore where you must use uh, the, in, the internal doctors. All right, a direct uh, open panel, you'll have the HMO contracting directly with doctors and hospitals. The HMO may capitate some providers, meaning paying them a monthly fee, regardless of whether they see patients or how much they do for a patient. It will differ depending on what the provider does, and the HMO will be involved in medical management in a whole host of ways that we will talk about 
in subsequent classes. The IPA model is a little different. The IPA contracts with the MDs and says, well, I will bring in these HMOs for you and you work for us. The HMO contracts with the IPA. The HMO will directly work with hospitals in the sense of saying, well, if we admit one of our patients with, an, with a heart attack, this is what, you know, and they'll discuss what will be paid and so on and so forth. Uh, and the IPA may not match how the MDs are paid. Uh, the IPA may get a monthly fee from the HMO, and then that IPA may pay the individual doctors for the, for the actual services they deliver. The IPA may or may not conduct medical management. I tend to think most of the time they don't, meaning they don't monitor so much what they do. The doctors do medically, but they will structure their, their contracts to uh, incentivize them to provide appropriate care rather than the incentives of fee-for-service, which is to provide more care. Uh, the network model is a little different. It's when the HMO will contact with a huge medical group or a large medical service organization. Uh, think of the big Westchester group uh, of doctors. I, I don't really remember their name up. I believe they're located in Katona. You might see substantial risk sharing through global capitation where they set a specific per patient, per member, per month fee, and we'll talk more about that. But most of the responsibility is delegated to the providers for managing uh, all aspects of care and finance. The group model, an HMO will contract with a single medical group. It will generally be capitated. Depending on the contract, it may include payment for the hospital services or it may not. Um, and the medical group is a separate entity from the HMO. It may be fully employed by them, or it may have other um, contracts and capabilities also. It could go either way. The staff model is just what it says. The docs work for the HMO. They will only see HMO patients. They're generally on a salary, and I can assure you that they do not get any incentives for ex for, for doing extra work for a patient. Um, and they will follow the, um, the standard operating procedures and medical management uh, routines fairly quickly, strongly, because they are employees of the medical group. And if it's required under the law, even if they are fully employed and paid by the HMO, they will be set up sort of as a medical group. A mixed model um, is just what it says here. Uh, the HMO can contract to provide medical services both with medical groups or with separate physicians. Um, something like this would probably work real well for an HMO that is dealing with both uh, high population areas and perhaps those areas that are more rural in nature and might have more independent physicians. Point of service plans are, are pretty interesting. They can combine both um, an HMO and an indemnity insurance. And basically, if you use a HMO doctor, one who's contracted, and follow the HMO rules, you're covered in full and you have no out-of-pocket of course other than whatever your copay is if it exists and if you go out of the network uh, then you have more significant cost sharing issues it can range from anything from a large deductible before any coverage goes into effect it can also be higher co-payments it's usually a percentage um, so it could be something as simple as, well, if you're out of network, you, you know, you have a $50 copay or a $100 copay instead of a $20 copay. Uh, frequently, you have to have a certain deductible, maybe $1,500 out of pocket for non-network physicians before they will pay for something. Um, it's often mandatory in some states, and it's an expensive form of coverage. 
Um, I think perhaps more people went out of um, out of the network than perhaps uh, some of these plans calculate. Um, this is a nice table from the textbook, and it shows you the difference between some PPO plans and some point of service plans, and um, the things that are most attractive to people for the uh, point of service plans um, is uh, the levels are comprehensive for coverage when you're in network. There is no deductible. Uh, there's a small copay. And uh, the PPOs, um, the advantages are you can usually um, get a limited in-network differential and you're not confined to an HMO service area. And of course, you don't have to go through a gatekeeper to get your coverage, um, to get um, your coverage for certain benefits and non-emergency care. Well, consumer directed health plans is one of those experiments um, that should be very interested. And basically, uh, they do provide preventative care from day one. But they're basically what, what are called high deductible plans. And that means that you have no coverage for a medical incidence until you hit a certain deductible, which is usually several thousand dollars and could be five or six thousand dollars for a family coverage. Usually they're, they're, they're um, combined with a health savings account, which is tax deductible in the sense that you put the money in before paying taxes. And you can use that money to um, pay your bills until you hit your deductible. Um, the concept behind this is if you're spending your own money, you might make better and perhaps cheaper decisions about your health care. It can be linked to a prefer preferred provider organization. And it's, as he puts it here, it's predicated on consumers having access to useful information. In my opinion, it's more predicated on having a consumer who's perhaps highly educated on healthcare and can make these decisions. I'm not so sure that that's gonna happen that often. And this is clearly a work in progress. You'll find many physicians who, who are in, still in private practice or in group practices will have this type of insurance because A, they have the funds to pay for for their coverage, and B, they know how to make intelligent or at least highly educated decisions about the level of health care they truly need. Um, this is an example of uh, one of these programs, and you can see the deductible is about 1500 and then if, you, if they're part of a network, you have the pretty much standard 80-20, 60-40 out of network, and usually after you hit a certain dollar out of pocket and it can be high it can be many thousands of dollars the insurance will kick in at a hundred percent one of the interesting things about Obamacare is some of the plans such as the bronze plans can have very high deductibles and it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens with people with these plans if when they unfortunately have to pony up the money if they truly understood that if you have a plan with a large deductible and you spend $2,000 because you broke your wrist or something, and they say, well, I have insurance, and they go, yes, but you have a $5,000 deductible, pay us, um, it, it will be an interesting uh, thing to see as you know, Obamacare is uh, more and more involved in health care delivery and payment. A third-party administrator basically is just that. They watch everything and they take care of these employer groups. And you pay for the services as you need them. They'll often have a relationship with a rental PPO, meaning a bunch of docs who will provide services to your group and a utilization management company, which may or may not, which they may or may not want to be involved with. There are no risks. They're paid for a fee. You know, they're paid an administrative fee and um, there is regulation in some states, but it is different than an insurance company because that's not what they're doing. 
integrated healthcare delivery systems. And this is an interesting process that I, I think we're going to see more and more of. And it's where every where more than one type of provider participates, but they don't they're not employees. Um, they can be parts of um, the components of healthcare or not. So you can have hospitals and, and, their, and, and facilities like long-term care. You can have physicians that are primary care, specialty care, hospital-based, such as hospitalists would be a different part of the healthcare delivery system. This is an evolving and, and flexible type of situation that's ongoing. Uh, you can also have nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and pharmacists. Um, they're not all found in all types of integrated delivery systems, and the level of, of integration or coordination can vary. And I think depending on how that's all done depend, will, be, will predicate the success of this particular type of organization. Um, there are systems that are really integrated and there are many types of legal entities we don't have to worry about, but it, it had to be called an IDS, it has to really be integrated. And those systems can really improve quality and outcomes and lower the cost of, total cost of care because they have their act together. Everybody knows what's going on for a particular patient and it can make a big difference. Clinical integration really means that everybody knows what what they're doing, everybody knows what's going on, and everybody is working together for the same goal, which is consistent quality care and patient benefits and patient-centered focus. Um, this is the ideal in 1996, and I really think that only recently, with the incredible amounts of data integration that can go on, and um, the development of electronic medical records, this is now possibly a true reality that, that may work. So an IPA, which is a little different, is made up of individual groups. The main purpose of the IPA is to give physicians the power to contract with managed care organizations, be they HMOs or PPOs. They may or may not carry out medical management meaning, you know, uh, dictate what the doctors will do in certain treatment algorithms. They, they may or may not bear financial risk, meaning they may or may not be capitated. Um, it, it really depends on what they work out with each individual insurer. Group practice without walls. Very interesting. And these are, again, a, way, a, a response to providing physician power um, against uh, some of the managed care groups. My own doctor belongs to something called a Hudson Valley Medical Group. And it's a medical group, but he's my doctor and I don't even know where the group is. There is no group. It's, it's, it's a group on paper. And it's a management entity. You pay the bills, it shares incomes. Um, and it, uh, like I said, they practice where they did before. Their main purpose is to have a strong bargaining chip with managed care organizations. They will accept capitation. Uh, I would think the capitation is primarily occurring in California, not so much here. And I think one of the reasons it is is because Kaiser is in California for years in the West Coast, been very strong. And capitation has been common out there for many, many years. A practice management company basically does the business end for individual physician practices. Um, it didn't work very well because physicians are as tough to herd as, as cats. You might have a couple of single specialty groups, like a whole bunch of cardiothoracic surgeons or, or something may, may, may have something like this. Uh, and the physicians can be employed, they can be independent and just be paying for management services like paying bills, you know, accounts receivable, and just the general things that an office needs. And of course, they could theoretically uh, advocate 
for HMO favorable reimbursement. Okay, a physician hospital organization is made up of a hospital and its staff, which is all the staff. Um, and the admitting physicians um, can be the larger group, or uh, that might be a smaller group within the hospital. The IPA will make up the physician portion, and their goal obviously is to have a strong front to negotiate with MCOs. Providers may still contract directly with the MCO. They have a relatively weak structure where the physician can decide to participate or not, or it can be part of a somewhat actively managed uh, form where the physician may in fact be required to participate. Staff or an employed physician are are, in, are physicians that are directly employed by the hospital, some primary cares, some specialties. It's essentially a staff model HMO in the sense that the hospital pays them. So they have a lot of control over their doctors and that control allows them to have a stronger negotiating uh, front with the MCOs, particularly ones that need primary care practitioners. They generally will not accept risk. Um, they can be a core of the new medical home or accountable care groups that are part of the Obamacare laws. And they can be part of an integrated delivery system that also uses other model types in their healthcare delivery plans. Well, just from a um, historical point of view, there was something called a provider-sponsored organization. They're gone. Um, PSO now has a new meeting. Um, this didn't work, and it was one of the many experiments created under uh, the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. Um, what you need to know that's probably most important is that um, it, PSO is now called a patient safety organization by the CMS, and the CMS is the, is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Okay, so that's all I really want you to know about that. Um, Obamacare really doesn't prescribe or tell health plans what to do. They focus on benefits. They created a co-op plan and that this is something that's going to be interesting to see if it develops. Um, if they keep costs under control, they get to keep some of the money. They have to be relatively new and they really can't have any government sponsorship. This is actually an experiment that the Affordable Care Act is undertaking. And experimentation is important because otherwise how are we going to know if things work or not? Uh, accountable care organizations are different. This is an interesting form of an integrated delivery system and it's really being used for Medicare um, because they want to see what they can do. And the idea is that they are physician driven, focusing on relatively cheap uh, primary care. There are a lot of rules that have to be involved and it's in a pilot situation. My concern with, with these things is they are pilots and pilots, while they show um, that something can work, that doesn't mean it's gonna work across the board. The ACOs are facility driven. We're not sure that they're going to work. Um, they don't really have regulations, so we don't know what they're going to do yet. And they're going to start to pilot those in a year or so. Uh, when this slide was done, that was the case. They may have gotten off the ground already. Um, the jury is still out on this, uh, but I strongly would hope that we would encourage experimentation because the system we have now in this country surely is very expensive. It does deliver reasonable health care most of the time. 
but when we fail, we fail spectacularly on patients. And if you recall the slide on how much we spend on medical care in this country, clearly um, there is plenty of room for experimentation and improvement. So back in the 70s and 80s, uh, people thought that all health care would become vertically integrated, meaning everything would work under one umbrella. But that failed because the insurance company doesn't want to pay, the doctors want to treat, Hospitals want to be paid what they think they need, and it just didn't work. Now, what's happening is if you look around this area, more and more hospitals are, are, are employing physicians directly. Um, there's in Pennsylvania, for example, there's the Geisinger Clinic, which is a paradigm and a paragon of the staff model HMO. And what they've done is they have bought up all these thousands of little practices all over rural Pennsylvania, uh, kind of west of Harrisburg and north to the New York border. And they funnel all their patients to this huge giant hospital in Danville, Pennsylvania, which trust me is the middle of nowhere. And the only reason I know so much about it is I used to go there um, for my old company and you fly into this little tiny town in the middle of this is truly a company town. It's a hospital town. It's the only way to put it. And there this you go all around there. Every clinic is somehow related to Geisinger. So this idea of buying physician practices and keeping everything under tight control is really coming back into play and may very well work with the improved data integration we have today. So in the reality is very different. Um, things are changing. You know, healthcare is so large that there really is no clear cut way that anything is being done with either an IDS or an HMO or a PPO. Things are different and they're flexible. To, to the needs of the area. I, I would almost draw you a word picture of you fill a balloon with water and you know if you push in on one side it pops out a little on the other to adjust for the pressures and um, because of that you have very different management forms. They can be independent or a subsidiary a group practice. Uh, it can vary by the size and the complexity and then the whole issue of profit versus nonprofit can have an impact on how these things are run. Now, patient-centered medical home, um, this is again an experiment, and ideally it brings us back to the personal physician who, who directs your care, who cares about you as a person. Integrated, coordinated, integrated, coordinated, and I'm saying that twice because it's probably the most important part because I think if that's done, you'll have both quality and safety. You might have enhanced access to care. And what's interesting is to incentivize people to try this, um, they're going to pay you more for doing it right. One of the big issues in medical care today is we pay doctors a heck of a lot more for what they do than, than what they think. Uh, in many ways, the best news you can get is eh, just go home, it'll go away by itself, or here, take this pill and it'll go away. The doctor only gets an office visit fee for that. If he decides that you need an EKG, or he can do a procedure like Scopey or something, then he gets hundreds and thousands of dollars or more. So there is a perverse incentive not to pay for cognitive um, medicine. Uh, so these patient medical homes are going to have to be accredited and we've got to figure out how they're going to do, how they're going to do that. It's an interesting concept. We'll have to see if it works. And the question we have is, is primary care organized enough to do it? And do we have a structure that can support it? And there are three examples uh, of this, but I am not going to be showing those uh, in the interest of time and in the interest of, uh, of the course. I, I don't think we need to see that at this point. Um, there are some incentives for these patients, though. 
There can be financial uh, incentives for a medical home project where you get a fee, and if you come in under budget, you share in savings with the government. Um, it will depend on how sick or how much care the patient needs. And the way it works is the first 2% of the savings are going to go back to the government. And then 80% of the savings above the first 2% will be shared. And it will be allocated based on the number of months or time you have spent enrolling, enrolling the patient. So that's pretty an, an interesting way to do it. Um, MedPAC, which stands for Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, defines one of these ACOs as a com an accountable care organization, I'm sorry for the abbreviation, as a combination of everything. And it can include integrated systems, uh, PHOs, and hospitals, and um, multi-specialty groups. And I'm sorry, just to try to keep things straight, a PHO is a physician hospital organization. And it's going to be, and this will give credibility to the data, it's going to be uh, a defined popular population of patients, and there'll be Medicare patients, so it should be relatively easy to track the health care services that are provided to these groups. There might be both voluntary and, and interestingly enough, um, non-voluntary approaches, meaning doctors have to do it, patients will not be locked in. Do we pay a bonus? or only a bonus or only some other form of bonus that requires patient enrollment. Um, there are issues of risk. How do we provide out-of-network out care? Uh, changing behavior of patients who have long gone to um, point of services. And it is included in the Affordable Care Act, but they have not really gotten this going yet. In fact, there may be one or two running since these slides have been done but I am not aware of it, and I am not aware of any data yet coming out. I think it would take two or three or four years to really see something from this because they're going to be dealing, I would think, with a lot of chronic medical issues.